Good morning. A while ago, I slipped into a pew of one of Britain's most beautiful cathedrals on a Wednesday at dusk for evensong. I was chilled to the bone in the moment of the service when the choir sang the words of Mary's Magnificat recorded for us in Luke's Gospel. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted them of low degree. I'd spent that day sitting in the public gallery of a court, supporting someone who was giving evidence in a criminal trial concerning childhood sexual abuse. Mary's words expressing hope on behalf of the poor, the humble, and the powerless felt especially meaningful that evening in the aftermath of the trauma recounted. Several weeks later, I remembered those words of Mary again when I sat in a basement room in a different city with another woman giving testimony to investigators about the violent sexual assault she had endured at the hand of a teacher who lectured at the institution where she worked. In our individual lives and national lives and in this wider cultural moment, it feels like there is so much harm and loss. And so our awareness of injustice and the trauma and the damage it causes is particularly heightened. Now justice movements and popular philosophies like intersectionality thinking amplify and feed off the potency of the harm inflicted on a human being when wrong is done. And we're living in a generation that is currently crying out for justice. But that means when we really think about the pain of such harm, a word like forgiveness might make us flinch. Forgiveness can sound a lot in our cultural moment like a minimizing of harm. The former Archbishop of Cape Town, Desmond Tutu, held his post during the apartheid era in South Africa and won a Nobel Peace Prize in 1984 for his opposition to the brutal regime. And he led the country's Truth and Reconciliation Commission after the election of Mandela in 1994. And he was frequently seen crying during the hearings as victims faced and challenged their torturers, telling the stories and reliving the atrocities. The central purpose of the commission was to promote reconciliation and forgiveness among perpetrators and victims of apartheid by the full disclosure of the truth. Tutu said, forgiving is not forgetting, it's actually remembering. Remembering and not using your right to hit back. It's a second chance for a new beginning. And the remembering part is particularly important, especially if you don't want to repeat what happened. In other words, forgiveness and civil justice should not be mutually exclusive. But in current quests for justice, is it possible that we have lost the art of forgiveness in 21st century Britain? Instead, it feels like something more akin to hatred and a lack of tolerance, sometimes known as cancel culture, is all around us. From the impetus to punish a person whose ideas or behavior we disagree with by shunning the transgressor, or lobbying to get a person fired or banned from speaking or publishing or lecturing, a lack of grace thrives. Now, the solutions offered by identity politics just lead to an ever-increasing rage, division, and despair. Actual justice and peace elude us. High-profile individuals have had to endure campaigns of harassment and intimidation in the name of justice. And everyone in this room involved in public life will have experienced the volatile and ominous nature of interacting online and in other settings. But we're not alone in that experience. Ordinary people, including school children and teenagers, like my own children, are now fearful to express their thoughts lest they find themselves attacked and cancelled. And once singled out, it seems there is no hope for public forgiveness 
and much less for redemption. Public floggings are back in the form of group shaming and boycotting, but forgiveness is gone, a lost art from a bygone age. Accountability is everything, redemption feels impossible. Now, while free speech advocates and intellectuals may wring their hands in despair, I think we need to listen to what is bubbling under the surface of this cultural phenomenon. There's a passion for justice, at least in name, driving this. At its core, there's a stark refusal to roll over and just accept harm. There's a rejection of the unqualified relativism of postmodernism. After all, something matters in absolute terms. If injustice matters, individual matter, individuals matter, and potentially cultures matter, and society matters. And for so long, it is true that people in positions of power have been able to act with impunity, but now there's a manifest desire, albeit imperfectly, to finally hold the powerful to account. I believe the Christian faith has something profound to say to us in this cultural moment, as well as some important questions to pose to those pushing cancel culture. Firstly, it's worth considering why we might feel outrage at the suffering in the world or at perceived injustice at all. If this material world of biology, physics and chemistry is all there is, why should we experience disgust and fury at the unjust exploitation of human beings who are just the, merely the random products of the random process of chance, followed by the brutal outcome of a survival of the fittest process? Why should any of it matter? if we're just here as a blob of atoms, a confluence of biochemical reactions. Doesn't human rage at injustice, perceived or real, tell us something about who we are as human beings? Now, of course, materialists, agnostics, as well as Jews and Christians will experience anger and outrage in the face of injustice and the suffering of others but my question is, what can account for that anger? If human beings are made in the image of God, created with dignity, as the Old Testament puts it in the book of Genesis, that would apply whether an individual believed in it or not. If life is in some way sacred, we would all have a different way of seeing this and knowing it to be true. One Hebrew poet in the Old Testament put it like this. He said, God has set eternity into the hearts of people. Our human rage at injustice points beyond itself to the sacredness of life and that possibility of eternity in our hearts. The possibility that human beings are infinitely precious, unimaginably loved by our creator, image bearers of the divine. And secondly, if our culture holds out little possibility of redemption or forgiveness, and forgiveness is seen as moral weakness as it is, is this really what we want in the Western world? Redemption is one of the grand themes in the literature and art of the civilization that has mattered so much to us as human beings. Forgiveness and redemption are central Christian ideas and sometimes Western ideals, and they're being lost to the cold cruelty of cancel culture. Cruelty that is resonant of the denouncements of authoritarian regimes in the past. Some in my generation and, and younger have lost personal contact with such systems of the past, but at my age, I'm old enough to remember conversations with my grandparents who escaped from Eastern Europe after the Second World War in order to avoid being taken by the Soviets to Siberia. Coming to Britain with just the clothes on their backs, my father, who was just a small child when that happened, is alive today still. They had observed and lived under the cruelty of totalitarian political systems, 
both right wing and left. They showed me that we are wired as human beings for redemption, not for those kind of denouncements. As human beings then, the possibility of forgiveness matters greatly. So I think the big question today is this. Is there such a thing as forgiveness and redemption that doesn't minimize the harm that our cultural context rightly recognizes as serious? Is there such a thing as forgiveness that doesn't dehumanize people who have experienced horror and abuse? I want to suggest today that genuine faith that is shaped by the historic personality of Jesus Christ has something truly profound to offer us in this regard. The instinct in culture that harm matters so profoundly that a person must pay and even die some kind of social or professional death for transgression points beyond itself to the echo of a story that has given meaning to millions of people around the world for over 2,000 years. Jesus of Nazareth as God incarnate, God in the flesh, willingly died by crucifixion at the hands of the Romans. And Jesus' death by crucifixion is described in the New Testament as a ransom, an offering, a sacrifice. Jesus pays a price for the transgressions of the world and that means that forgiveness could be real. The price we all intuitively sense must be paid for harm is actually paid by Jesus. Forgiveness may have been rejected by some as a weakness that somehow denies the seriousness of wrongdoing, but Christian forgiveness doesn't say the thing that happened didn't hurt, wasn't wrong, or didn't matter. Forgiveness means the incident did hurt, it was wrong, and it does matter. Because every human being has been made in the image of God, our suffering or experience of abuse or harm matters profoundly. But I have the power to forgive you, to release you from my vengeance, because I can trust that ultimately justice will be done. I will commit to supporting civil justice in this life because I can trust that there will be eternal justice in the hands of God. The transgression and harm that will be judged by higher authority than you or me. And if any of us truly repent and own our wrongdoing, we could be forgiven in an ultimate sense because someone has paid. The heart of the Christian faith is the death of the Son of God in history. And it points to the extraordinary cost of forgiveness, the vast value placed on every person, whether they believe in God or not. Christian forgiveness underlines the seriousness of the hurt and evil that has occurred, since forgiving it required the suffering and death of God. That is not cheap. In practical terms, I want to suggest that the concept of Christian forgiveness would be a gift to any culture. Forgiveness and redemption are possible, and outrage at injustice have an actual foundation in reality in the worth of a human life. The Christian message acknowledges that wrongdoing is real and that there is real justice to be done. It challenges us to admit that we're all flawed and in some way ourselves need forgiveness. The late Queen Elizabeth II noted in her 2016 Christmas broadcast, forgiveness lies at the heart of the Christian faith. It can heal broken families, it can restore friendships, and it can reconcile divided communities. It is in forgiveness that we feel the power of God's love. My friend Archbishop Ben Kawashi served as the Archbishop of Jos in Plateau State, northern Nigeria, for many years. He survived three assassination attempts by jihadis, a brutal assault on his wife Gloria, and the burning of his home drove them to their knees. To forgive 
and find the strength to carry on serving the people of his community. And that is what they did. These are the terrorists who kidnapped hundreds of schoolgirls, Christian schoolgirls. The Korshis went on to adopt 85 orphans and live in a place of incredible tension with the most outstanding joy and peace I've ever seen. They live in a flow of forgiveness that builds schools and trains leaders to love across difference. They build churches and serve communities and lead to friendships across divides. Forgiveness in action is beautiful. It is compelling and it can help rebuild a broken world. The Christian offer of forgiveness is for everyone to receive it from God and then to be empowered to give it to others. To be offered forgiveness I don't deserve, that doesn't minimize any harm I may have caused, and yet affirms my value, is at the heart of God's forgiveness in Christ. And through the ages, this forgiveness has had the power to change the trajectory of a life, turning a person around, setting a person on a path of goodness and beauty and truth, instead of floundering in wrongdoing and harm. This forgiveness also has the power to liberate me from ongoing harm when I've been the victim. Since it liberates me from the burden of accomplishing vengeance, a feat that is beyond me. Since it releases me from living in a state of perpetual victimhood, since I can say I've been rescued and redeemed, Forgiveness frees us from living in bitterness and enables us to live in peace. So I want to suggest to you today, the power to forgive may just be the greatest gift that the Christian story could offer our age. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa report noted this. We've been privileged to help heal a wounded people. Though we ourselves have been, in Henry Nguyen's profound and felicitous phrase, wounded healers. When we look around us at some of the conflict areas of the world, it becomes increasingly clear that there is not much of future for them without forgiveness and reconciliation. God has blessed us richly so that we might be a blessing to others. Quite improbably, South Africans have become a beacon of hope to others locked in deadly conflict that peace that a just resolution is possible. If it could happen in South Africa, then it can certainly happen anywhere else. Such is the exquisite, exquisite divine sense of humor. Let me end with those words again. The power to forgive may just be the greatest gift that the Christian story can offer our age. Thank you for listening.